cover <clears throat> the last chapter in that Wallace book, Project Management and Strategic Planning. And mostly it's project management. We're going to talk about what a project is and uh, what's a project management process. Uh, what is project management, the kind of software you might use to do it, success and failure, and then a little bit about IS, uh, information system, strategic planning, and the human element. So what is a project versus a process? A project, a process is something that you do for daily work, and you do it on a repeated basis. A manufacturing process, an order management process. These are all processes that you do multiple times a day, an hour, and repeat them over and over again. A project oftentimes is a temporary. It may have its own budget and timeline. It might be unique and there's a lot of uncertainty involved, especially if it's the first time you've ever done a project. Like a project could be building a skyscraper. If you build a second skyscraper that's almost identical to the first, a lot of the uncertainties are not there because you've already done it once. A process, on the other hand, is repeated. It's efficient and cost-effective because you've designed it to be such. It's streamlined and a little bit more predictable, a lot more predictable perhaps than a project. Um, processes tend to be your normal work. A project is something outside your normal work. It's above and beyond, or maybe in place of your normal work. In other words, your leader or boss may come to you and say, listen, we want you to be part of this project, and you're going to have to take two hours a day to do this. Gee whiz, boss, I'm already pretty busy, I know, but you got to figure out some way to do it, and probably you're going to have to put in longer hours, is what that usually means. So that's in addition to your regular work. There could be another time where they come and say, listen, we're implementing a new ERP system, and we want you to be the lead for order management. And, okay, uh, how much time is it going to take? 100% of your time. We're taking you out of your normal job for two years to be part of this project. And then, well, gee, what will I do when the project's done? Don't worry, we guarantee you'll have a job. Maybe not your old job, but we guarantee you'll have something. And usually you'll know the system more, so you'll be indispensable to us. That often happens. There's something called a triple constraint, or it's called the, the project management triangle. I may have another presentation I present that shows it as a triangle. But you're trying to do three things with a project. You're trying to maintain a cost budget. You're trying to maintain a, maintain a timeline budget. And there's a scope of what you want the project to accomplish. Now, generally, we want it to do all three of these things. We want it to be, you know, keep the cost contained. We want it to be on time. And we want to achieve all the functional specification goals of the project. But the reason you have the triple constraint is you want to determine as management or as a project manager, which one is most important to you. If you consider a NASA space launch, they're really interested in the mission and the scope. So if push comes to shove, they're willing to raise the budget or extend the timeline to make sure that the scope of the mission is achieved. And one of those things in the scope of the mission is human health and safety. They don't want to lose any more spaceships or astronauts. I think they, we've had four major disasters and a couple near misses. So here, scope is the most important thing and mission attainment is the most important thing. Now you might have another project where, listen, we're spending $2 million on this project. I do not want 
if you go one penny above two million, I'll have your head. So they're telling you there that cost is the most important thing. And if push comes to shove, you might change the scope to make sure you stay underneath the cost. And changing the scope means usually doing less than you originally planned. And you might change the time. You might take a little bit longer if it costs less. Not oftentimes taking longer, but usually if it's cost-based, the scope changes. The other thing is time. Listen, we have to launch this at the end of the second quarter of next year. And we're doing that because that's our lowest point in sales. And we don't want it to go any longer because it cannot jeopardize our peak season. Let's say it's back to school or let's say our peak season may be uh, the holiday season. So we're doing it. We want to implement this at the end of the first quarter of next year. Now, if we can't achieve all three, we have to maintain this timeline. We're willing to spend more to get to that timeline, and we're willing to trade off some of the scope, some of the specifications of planned uh, activities and, and dimensions of what the design was. So here you have these three things. Again, you want to do all three if possible. And in fact, you should insist on all three, but you want to know what your primary dominant constraint is. A project management process has these, this is a generic way of looking at it. You're initiating the project, you're planning, you're executing, you're monitoring, and you're closing. All of them have formal start, starts and stops, but they also overlap by nature. And we talked about overlapping in some of the previous lectures in this class. Obviously, you want to initiate, define what you're doing. And as much as you're defining what you're doing, you're defining what you're not doing. And this is the initial planning. Initial, you know, that's, what are we going to do? What's going to be involved? What's the broad scope of this? The broad timeline and broad budget. Then you refine that in your planning process. And you end up planning all the way through. Then you're actually setting up your monitoring and controlling of the process and then begin executing. And these two things, this monitoring and, and controlling is part of your planning as well. How are you going to do that? So your monitoring and controlling starts almost with your planning. But then you also want to start executing. As you learn things, you don't want to wait till your planning is all done to execute. You want to start, you know, if one of the things you're sure we're going to need a team of 50 people and we've got to go recruit them and pry them out of their current jobs, we can start doing that right away. We're going to need X number of computers and this kind of software, hardware, whatever. Uh, you can buy that ahead of time. But then when you get into the meat of it, your planning should be almost done or, and tapering off and you execute. And as you're executing, the reason you don't stop planning is you're going to run into roadblocks. And your monitoring and controlling is going to sh then kick in and say, listen, this is going to affect the scope, the time, or the budget of the project. What do we want to do? So you're constantly kind of planning and replanning. Then when it's done, you want to have a formal closing. That's the handing off of the results of the project to the customers. They could be internal or external. You want to do an after action review. What went well with this project in case we do another project like this? How do we manage it? What do we do? And you want to have a formal closure in which you thank everybody that worked on it and actually do a little bit of celebrating. So initiating, you have the groundwork, the project chart. Project chart is huge. And then if we do another presentation on this, which I probably should, um, I, I will emphasize what the project charter is, um, and maybe that'll be one of our discussion exercises, how to write a project charter for something. Then you do some planning. You know, you've got to talk about how you're going to structure the project, what are the different phases, what are the different activities that you do, and I will cover that more in detail in the other presentation. I'm just giving you the overview that's in the textbook here. What are the deliverables? The, 
big deliverables are going to be in a project charter on a, on a broad scope. But then you're going to give more refined de deliverables as, as you make your project plan more uh, detailed. There's this thing called work breakdown structure. I like to use the example of a, you were building a nuclear submarine. That's a project. Um, the sub projects underneath it, the first level of work breakdown structure is the drivetrain. Uh, probably even separate from the drivetrain is the reactor, the hull, the weapons systems themselves, the weapons control systems, and vehicle control systems, the ship control systems, and all of the appointments, basically the furniture and galley and all those kinds of things. Each one of those is a project in themselves. The next level of work breakdown structure will take the propulsion, the drivetrain, and break it down into the, you know, the, the transfer from the energy source, be it diesel or most likely nuclear, to get it to the drive shaft, how, the design of the drive shaft, the, is it twin or single propellers, uh, what are the controls on the, you know, the flaps of the, submarine to make it maneuver, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then with each one of those, you have another level of work and design that has to happen. So a sophisticated project could have 10 levels of work breakdown structure, and all those are reflected in a chart that tells you, like in this example here, this is one level of work breakdown structure. The indent is the next level of work breakdown structure. And you start have this timeline across here. Say, when is this supposed to start? When is it supposed to stop? And next thing you know, when you have this all done, you have a very detailed plan for what you have to do. And you can imagine if it's something like a nuclear submarine, you can't do it all by pencil and paper. And we'll talk about that later. Executing is coordinating all these things assigning the manpower and making sure they start when they're supposed to start and if monitor it along the way to make sure that you're on track to finish at that point. So you want to do all those coordinating efforts. Uh, monitoring, you want to track progress. You want to look at the things that are necessary to be done before the next thing can start. And you want to find something called the critical path. The critical path in a project is those sequence of projects that must happen and define the maximum length of all those sequential projects together, that defines the minimum possible time you can finish a project in. We're not going to spend a lot of time in this. We cover this more in operations management, BSC 2510. So if you've had that, you've already seen that, uh, you had uh, an exposure to that. Closing, you want to end it in an orderly way. You want to document your lessons learned. You also want to make sure you hand off whatever the deliverable was to those you're supposed to deliver it to. Now, for a, any sophisticated project, you want to have a project manager. I like to refer to the project manager if I was the, the leader or the stakeholder or the sponsor of the project, one throat to choke, so to speak. If the project's not going well, I want to reach out to one person and say, what's going on? Brief me on this. Tell me what's going on. Are we on track? Are we not on track? Are we on budget? Not on budget? On time? Not on time? On scope? Not on scope. So the project manager has to have strong leadership skills, obviously excellent communication skills, has to be a manager of people because sometimes you're herding cats to try to get things done. You have to be a tremendous influencer. All those things, you know, strong leadership, excellent communication, outstanding people skills, means that you're you're very good at influencing people. You have to know when to be 
a dictator and you have to know when to be a buddy. You have to know when to be congenial and affiliative, and you have to know when to be basically a dictator. And again, so you want technical competence in project area. So you want to know uh, whatever the project is about that you have some experience in. You don't want to be a school teacher and now in charge of building that nuclear submarine. You want to have someone that has built a nuclear submarine or been part of a team that's built one before, if not a project manager on a previous nuclear submarine build. Uh, if you're implementing IT, you don't want to have the HR uh, VP running that uh, or an HR professional running that if they have no ERP or IT skills. Uh, you could have a strong business person running it because it's the business people that actually, um, as we've talked about before, ERP systems have to be business-led. But you could have co you could have a business person in charge, and a number two person would most likely be an IT person. Uh, so you want good listening skills, strong team building skills, uh, good problem solving and critical thinking skills, and ability to balance priorities, stay organized, keep the team on track. So what are we talking about? Strong leadership, people, you know, personality skills, people skills. Excellent communication, that's your people skills. How do you communicate to others? So people skills themselves are strong. Uh, this is not people-oriented. Good listening, that's a personal people-oriented skill. Strong team building skill, people-oriented skill. Excellent presentation skills. Again, it goes with good communications abilities. Uh, I don't know why it's a separate one, but it's a people-oriented skill. Good problem-solving and critical thinking skills, not necessarily a people skill. An ability to balance priorities, stay organized, and keep the team on track. That's a strong people-oriented skill. Um, project management software. If you have a project like a nu nuclear submarine, you don't want to do it in on pencil and paper on the wall of a large conference room, moving around magnetic things to show the progress and everything. You want to have it all computerized. And a lot of project people use Microsoft Project, which is probably the uh, main project management tool that's used for large projects. But there are now a lot uh, other competitors, and I'm not sure where we stand on the market share of all those competitors. So you want to manage the time, manage the people and resources, manage the costs, and you want to have it all tied together. So if you make a change in something, the change gets reflected. If I change the time, it should change the people and resources needed and maybe even change the costs. If I change the costs or make something shorter, I have to adjust everything else to make sure we're sure that the entire project gets done on a shorter timeline. Why do projects fail? Anything significant in business, anything monumental change in the way you run business, uh, whether it's quality improvement, ERP, implementation, large projects, or just trying to change a the culture. They all have the same features and number one is executive support. Things like this don't happen unless you have strong leadership. And that's number one and number two. Right there, lack of executive support and lack of stakeholder involvement. So you want a sponsor for a project and you want the other people that kind of are his peers but stakeholders. Another thing is if you have unclear requirements, again, that comes from the executive. The other thing that fails is, and it's not necessarily an executive thing by itself, is scope creep. In the project charter, you have to define exactly what the project is to accomplish, and you might want also want to define what the project is not going to accomplish. It's like the little old lady that has her outside of her house painted, but then asks the painter if he wouldn't mind touching up something on the inside. And he goes, oh yeah, it'll just take a few minutes. I'll, I'll come in, I'll use the same paint maybe, and clean this up a little bit. 
And the little old lady was happy, so she asked the next day, Oh, I can't change this light bulb in the family room. Would you please change the light? You sure? And next thing you know, he's spending a third of his time doing handiwork around the house for free because the scope of his painting job got expanded by the nice little old lady that hired him. And he got sucked into it. The other way scope creep changes, or scope can be expanded, is you start off solving one problem, and you think, oh, this is related to that, and that's related to that, and if we're really going to do it right, we've got to change that. The next thing you know, your project to implement uh, an ERP system ends up with a project to solve world hunger. So, uh, poor communications, and the communication starts again with the executive. <clears throat> the scope group can be should be managed by the executive team. It insists that he's not or she's not responsible for causing the scope group. And escalation of commitment. And I'm not sure I'm not seen that before, but I'm not sure what it means in this book. So I won't try to uh, pretend like I know what it is, but I can look it up because I got the book right here. Boy, this is a bad real-time presentation, isn't it? I'm going to look up something that I should know already. So let's see, project management. I should be talking just to uh, save a little time here and fill up the my projects succeed and why they fail. Should be in there someplace. Escalation of commitment, the tendency to continue investing in a project despite mounting evidence that it has not succeeded. So you got to know when to cut bait and run, basically, is what they mean by that. Sorry about that. So success factors, the people factors, the organizational factors, project factors, project management factors, external factors. Does the project have executive support and sufficient resources? Do you have talented, motivation, motivated personnel assigned to the project? Do you have leaders with project management expertise? And um, one of the things for any significant project that most companies, they like to have someone that's PMP certified. There's a project management institute and they have the, probably the best, other than CPA, the best certification in business out there. If people have a PMP certification, they're, they're golden. They can go and work almost any place because that certification really indicates that you have learned some project management basics and can probably run a project. And I've not seen a bad PMP. I'm sure there are, but I haven't seen them. So that's a really good certification. If you like project management and want to get started, you can't even begin to take the test to be a PMP unless you've had 4,000 hours of project management experience, which means that's two full years of because there's about 2,000 working hours in a year. So that's two full years of project management experience. A strategy to manage confl conflicts amongst the stakeholders, and that's executive level. Uh, organizational factors, involvement and buy-in from a broad range of end users, an objective that is perceived to be aligned with the business goals, project factors, a clear objective and well-defined scope that starts with the charter, a design that will not that will allow any new systems to interact with existing systems. So if you're putting something, if you're not redoing the entire systems, but you're design, redesigning a part of it, does it interact with all the other systems it has to interact with? Uh, a company I used to work for was looking at, okay, we could use project management, uh, you know, if we're doing uh, warehouse management or we're doing transportation management or quality management, they just insisted that everything they were going to do was SAP and work with SAP to develop because it was early on. We were one of the first implementers of SAP 
And every time we wanted to do something, we would work with SAP to develop the module, their own module, so that we could guarantee that would have a seamless fit. So um, project management factors, a well-defined system development methodology that is appropriate for the project, appropriate project management software and other tools, a clear change control process for managing scope creep, or may just you're going to run into things you're not ready for. I mean, one thing that, that could happen, you're, you're building a new building, you excavate the land, you come across um, uh, an ancient burial ground. Do you just keep digging and put the foundation of the building in? Or do you have to stop and see what kind of antiquity you might have run across and maybe delay your project by months or years because you have to now do an archaeological excavation before you can start continuing your building. Maybe you end that and go and build your building someplace else find a new site but that's an extreme example a lesser example is you start excavating and find that uh, you have an environmentally um, hazardous uh, land that you found now hopefully you've done a test ahead of time so you're not finding that out once you've committed uh, a strategy for assessing quality of your operation and a clear process for monitoring and tracking progress and then external factors. You want to make sure that you have really good agreements with your vendors and consultants. A lot of times, especially in IT, you're hiring outside consultants to help you. Uh, they can tend to take over the project if you let them. It's your project. You have to lead it. You have to use them as sound advisors, but not let them dictate to you what has to be done. They may know more than you at the beginning. You have to be a quick learner and learn. So strategic planning for IS, vision, principles, policies. Uh, a lot of companies have gone to a strict budgeting and cost-benefit methodology, almost like a capital budget review, because IT can be as expensive. So you have the regular budgeting process. You have your capital budgeting process to decide are we building a new factory, a new warehouse, a new office building? Are we expanding to an existing factory, warehouse, or office building? Are we shutting down an existing factory, warehouse, or office building? You've almost got it, and those are capital budgets. You almost have to have a mirror. Th you want to allocate budget annually to IT maintenance, improvement, and replacement. So you almost have to have a budgeting process that says, what do we, we have this much money to spend on I, IS next, next year. How do we want to spend it? Everybody has their projects. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to database this. I want to do big data that. I want to do, you, you just fill in the blank. There's so many things. Now, sales wants this functionality added. Manufacturing wants that functionality added. Finance wants to do this. You have projects that cost three times what you budgeted for. How do you prioritize and rank those? So you have a portfolio of projects. How do you decide what to, what to do? Now, strategically, too, you've got to look at disaster recovery, which includes cybersecurity, as we've talked before. So this is just what we're talking about in IS. Uh, you've got to have someone that's always thinking about it because IT can become stale very quickly. It can be outdated and outmoded. If the world is moving to something else and you're caught flat-footed, you may have to react and act faster than you wanted to in the first place. Um, I think when you talk about vision principles and policies, funding models are what I just talked about, the budgeting process. Uh, acceptable use and security policies. Most companies have had to tighten that up considerably due to cybersecurity needs. And enterprise architecture. How do you want to be structured? I mean, one thing that we're facing right now with COVID 
is everybody's working from home. I think that I'm not sure the same firewalls work as well. So is there an increase in cybersecurity attacks? Are they more successful? Uh, how do you structure that? And if we move coming out of this to a more work remotely kind of model, how do we want to do that? How will that be structured? What do we want to see? How will people replace computers? And how will, you know, do you need a, 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 an in-house IT department that sets up computers and hands them out to people and collects old ones? And if you have a hardware issue, uh, fixes computers. Maybe you need a third party person that does it with the reach of where all your people are. Maybe they go to the person's house and you might pay a little bit more for something like that, but you're saving money on people commuting. Uh, your project management proposal portfolio is all the various projects that you have and you want to keep track of where all of them are. What is the priority? Here they seem to have three, one probably being the the, the most uh, expenses to date and the risk rating. I imagine a risk of one is safe and a risk of five is, hey, let's pay attention to this M-Commerce initiative and let's pay attention to this mobile app. But if we look at the risk for the money, I'm looking at the mobile, at the M-Commerce initiative, there's a lot of money tied up, $15,000. There's a risk rating, maybe it's high, I don't know, but this is one way of organizing something like that. I'm sure there's more sophisticated ways. Uh, deciding which projects to pursue and which not to pursue, I think we've already talked about that. And disaster recovery and business continuity. Um, I don't know how this fits in strategy. I mean, it has to be part of your strategy. I mean, why isn't data management part of your strategy? Why isn't cybersecurity part of your strategy? But disaster recovery is you want to make sure that your system is backed up and it can be brought back online as quickly as possible should a meteor hit your server site or you get a major hack and you want to not pay the hacker for your information back, but just go back to your latest update, your latest backup, the human element. Well, we've covered this in microeconomics a little bit, but it doesn't hurt to go over it again. There's a variety of biases that people have, and it's worth revisiting them here. Confirmation bias is a tendency to choose information to review that supports our existing position and ignore conflicting evidence. It's really hard to know, but you've got to listen to other people to make sure that you're not doing that. Usually your best bet there is to have someone else say, hey, listen, I'm not sure you're seeing this. And you've got to be open to such input. Overconfidence, the act of having more faith in our own estimates than is re realistically justified. Uh, again, you have to be aware of that, and you have to be a little skeptical. You have to know what you know, but not pretend like you know everything. And again, other people have to like kick the tires on it. And in both the confirmation and overconfidence, if you're the project manager, you don't want to use your persuasive abilities and your position to quiet them into submission and suppress them into submission, as opposed to listening to what they have to say, working it out, and, and logically and data-based proving who's right. Planning fallacy. Oh, I am so sometimes into you know guilty of this. The tendency to underestimate the time it will take to complete a task. Sometimes... And, and it falls both ways for me. Sometimes I like, oh, this is not going to take very long. And like two days later, and I'm like, I'm supposed to be done like 30 hours ago. 
the other one is, I think it's going to take six hours, but once you start, it goes so fast, you overestimate it too. Anchoring, reliance on one piece of information, however irrelevant. Mm. Yeah, I don't know how, I keep thinking of the COVID thing and maybe the malaria drug here. I don't know if it's irrelevant or not, but it's that kind of thing. Are you going to just fixate on one thing? Don't do that. Don't anchor yourself on something that is not important to the overall project. Availability bias. The tendency to judge the probability of an event based on how easily examples come to mind. The thing with probabilities, and we're talking about risk here, is oftentimes you don't know what the probabilities are until you actually get involved. Hindsight bias, the belief that an actual event was predictable even if it was not. I mean, you know, hindsight is 2020, as they say, and anybody, a Monday morning quarterback and all that. So be very careful about those things. So here's a summary. We talked about projects, definition. We talked about project management process. Uh, some of the software involved, success and failure, uh, what's uh, involved in information systems, strategic planning, and a little bit of the human element, the kind of biases that we're often faced with when we're trying to manage projects. Um, I will probably uh, record my lecture in 2510, Operations Management on Project, the opening lecture on project management. Because I probably need to do that for some future ops class anyway. And it will hopefully provide a lot more context in what we just talked about. All right. Thank you very much. And we will talk soon.